listening to the Top Music Guitar Podcast, the show for guitar teachers to learn about the craft of teaching great guitar lessons that students love. If you're looking to start or expand your studio and make guitar teaching your full-time dream job, you've come to the right place. Each week, you'll get to hear from some of the top guitar teachers from around the globe and get their best tips and experiences so that you too can build your own dream studio. I'm your host, Michael, and I've founded one of the top guitar schools in Australia, written a best-selling curriculum, and I mentor guitar teachers. I'm excited to share my expertise with you and the wisdom of all the experts we interview. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Let's get into it. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast. We are quickly approaching our 50th episode and to help us celebrate, we've got a special promotion where we want to hear from you. If you're a guitar teacher and you've got some advice, we want to have 50 guitar teachers sharing 50 guitar tips for our 50th episode. So read the description and see how you can get involved and get your voice on the podcast. Now, we are approaching our 50th episode. We are have been running for just about a year now. And when I first launched the program, there was a, a very special guest that I had in mind who I thought would be one of the best fits for this podcast in terms of teaching about business, building a music school, running uh, all kinds of lesson programs. He's a, a wealth of knowledge. If I read out all his credentials, we'd be here all day. But someone who I think is an absolute expert in the field of uh, music schools, music education, and that's Johnny Wilson from Build a Music School. So, Johnny, welcome to the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast. Hey, Michael, thanks so much for having me, and uh, congratulations on the uh, big milestone approaching. That's huge. Yeah, it's, it's been an awesome thing, and I, I really do say every time that I've got the best job in the world. I just get to reach out to other people like yourself who are passionate about learning and helping other people, whether that's in a business capacity or in the teaching classroom as well, and take the knowledge that you've got and share it out so that we can have a bigger impact on the current generation and future generations of both music teachers and their students. And I think that's a message that resonates with you pretty well. Yeah, absolutely, man. So I really appreciate being on. And I can just say that when I was sort of starting out and building a studio, I never got to listen to a cool podcast like this. So um, I'm jealous jealous of your listeners who get to um, get a head start with great resources and guests that you've uh, procured. Yeah, but it's really, really awesome. And then we just thank you so much for giving us your time to guest on the show. And I always introduce my guests as being a real treat for the audience, and today is going to be no exception. So, Johnny, thanks for coming on. You have quite a, a bit of a journey, which I'm familiar with parts of it, and there's also been parts which I'm sure in the last couple of years since we've had a conversation, there's a whole bunch of extra chapters which have been added. So, can you give us a brief overview of your background and your story so far? Yeah, sure. I'll give you the the quick as um, I can version. I um, I learned to play the drums, and I kind of didn't do very well at school and I just wanted to be in bands and play music and so I decided to do a music degree and I had a drumming teacher that kind of changed my life uh, and and from learning with him I went from being kind of a failed high school student to getting you know nearly straight A's in my jazz performance degree on the drums and he, he turned my life around so much that I decided that I wanted to be like him and help other students. And so I set out to like pay my way through university, teaching the drums, doing one-on-one lessons. And uh, once I finished and got my degree, I thought, heck, I'm going to build a music school, change as many lives as I can. And I started uh, you know, hiring people to help me with the same ethos. And that 30 students rapidly became uh, about 2,000 students, a team of 60 people. And we did a whole lot of other crazy things. And so we built, yeah, the, the largest music school in New Zealand. And now I help build music schools all over the world. Fantastic. And what a story to go from someone. And these are always the best turnaround success stories where you go from the struggling student or the person who's just not in the right lane and then you get in the right lane and, and it, you know, it changes the whole trajectory of your life and the lives of many around you. Yeah, yeah. I was really lucky to find the thing that I love to do. And I think a lot of musicians feel the same way. They've they've found, they've kind of hit the jackpot in a sense where they've found their passion, where I have a lot of friends who are, they might have good salaries, but they aren't actually 100% sold out and passionate about what they do. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, especially our listeners, may be in that point in a classroom job they're not quite happy with or are thinking about going and following their passion. And sometimes you need a little bit of a nudge, but you know it, it is well worth it. You only get one life. It's too short to spend doing something you don't like. So, Go and follow your passion, guys. And if you're lucky enough like Johnny, and I don't think luck 
lucky is ever the right word, but if you've taken the, the action and the time to really figure out what you want to do and then go out and pursue it, it's one of the most rewarding things you can do. Yeah, absolutely. When you find that thing that you love, um, it doesn't feel like work so much because you, you're just absolutely gunning for it and you love it and so you work harder and then you get more results. Yes, most indeed. Now, you mentioned that you've now helped found the biggest music school in New Zealand, which is absolutely amazing. How did you sort of go about growing from a single one-person operation up until, as you've said, uh, employing 60 team members and I'm assuming hundreds if not thousands of students at this point? And uh, building the brand that you did in a Good Time Music, that's the name of your academy, isn't it? Yeah, Good Time Music Academy, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it started with, like most people, you know, you do a great job being a great private teacher that really cares and puts effort into your curriculum and opportunities for students. And then you build a waiting list and you can't take them all on because you're you know, you're working too much. And so you look at your waiting list and you sort of ask yourself, well, should I forward these all on to other people in the community who teach? Or should I start to build my own little school and teach? I'm obviously doing something successful, so how do I package that and bring someone else on, teach them what works? And so that's what I did. So my uh, one of my top students, his name was Nathan. He was about to go to university and study uh, music. And I said, hey, would you like to take you know these 15 students from the waiting list and um, you know I'll build this extra little drum space for you? And we did that, and he had a student job where he didn't have to go work at McDonald's or a supermarket or something, and that's where it started. And then we set out just to build Good Time Drum Academy back then. And then all the kids have brothers and sisters, right? And so they start asking, oh, do you do piano lessons? Do you do guitar lessons? Do you do singing lessons? And you just start taking little opportunities and finding people and and Nathan was at university, so he was friends with all his other students that wanted wanted jobs. And, you know, the word gets out that you can earn money working with Johnny. And uh, so that's how it started. And then as you uh, as you get further on, you have to get more and more systems and more and more professional and more and more, uh, you know, uh, admin support and filling the holes in your own skill set to get better and better. And that that's kind of how it snowballed up. And um, that's you know, a very short summary, but that's how we got off the ground from being a one-man band into an actual music school. Fantastic. And how did your approach to music and teaching and business change? Was there a part where you transitioned from a musician to being a business owner? Yeah, I think of it as almost kind of like a like a triangle, like you, um, you know, at the base of the triangle, the the biggest part, you're doing all the stuff, you know, you're wearing all the 50 hats. And if you think about you and your listeners, they're going to be doing, you know, the teaching, the curriculum prep, the administration, the the billing, the, you know, the cleaning of the studio, the, the marketing, like there's legitimately probably 50 hats uh, that you've got to wear. And so as you, as you progress, you basically have to wear less and less hats and push things further down. So you sort of approach um, you know, at the top of the triangle being more and more narrow with the things that you are the best at. And usually it's not just the things you're the best at, it's also the most high value tasks. So I'd think about it in terms of, uh, I remember back then going, you know, 50 grand would be a great salary to have, you know, coming fresh out of university. That was a, that was a good salary now, uh, back then. Not, not anymore. But uh, I remember thinking, okay, well, 50 grand is about $25 an hour. So every task on my list would I pay someone $25 an hour to do that? No, probably not. Well, I shouldn't be doing it then. And so who can I hire to do that, you know, for $15 an hour or $20 an hour? So I had that sort of mindset. And and then eventually you say, hey, well, my time's worth $75 an hour and $100 an hour. And you start to pass things down. And I think that mindset of um, not just the money side, but in terms of I'm trying to grow something, I can't do everything. If I want to build a big school and help more people, well, I can't teach every student. I can't do all the admin. So it's one of like maximizing the value of your time and also being inspired by helping as many people as possible. I think they're definitely write it down as if you're listening at home in terms of identifying your highest priority task and you know, focusing on those and delegation and, and things like that into it. Was there anything you found that, uh, you were really good at and you sort of were able to prioritize easily? Uh, I I'm, I'm, think I'm pretty good at marketing and telling the story and sort of getting out there. And I would, I would get out in the community and perform a lot to inspire kids to come and learn. 
Uh, I was also good at team building and and leading people. Uh, I've had to come along come a long way with those those skill sets, but I I did kind of ha- grow up with a lot of really incredible leaders around me um, through school and church and sports, and so I I knew what a good leader was, and so I was passionate about developing those skills, and that was one of the most essential things in terms of growing. Yeah, how, how important do you think personal development and uh, not necessarily like doing leadership courses, obviously it has its place in in uh, companies and when you've got multiple employees, but just the, the importance of personal development and trying to become a better version of you. Oh, it's um, it's almost everything. Like I, I was a real nerd with that stuff. Like I did some things that most people would think were totally weird. So every quarter of the year I would go away and I was, I was just a single guy then, you know, in my uh, early 20s. I would go away to a hotel an hour away um, by myself and just do journaling and thinking through the business and reading certain books and dreaming up big ideas. And every uh, all the cool ideas and things that I've done over the years have come out of most of those sort of planning weekends. And so really investing like the time intentionally, blocking it out in the calendar. Um, things I've done have been like uh, the, the first of the month, always block out at least half a day to just work on your all your strategic planning, checking how you're aligning, retweaking stuff. You've always got books and podcasts on the go. Uh, also a percentage of my income goes towards professional development. And so uh, now my team also has a percentage of their income goes towards professional development. And so it's, we can literally pinpoint moments where we've spent X amount on this sort of course or this training or hiring this consultant to come in or meeting with a person for lunch and you see the effects of it and your growth afterwards. Uh, as long as you're someone that actually doesn't just absorb all the content because a, a good thing for people to be aware of and write down is that uh, you know professional development can be a form of procrastination. So where the magic happens is drawing in all that information and inspiration, but then going and actually applying it. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point because there's, uh, and I'm sure we've all been searching for that wonderful routine and what works really well for somebody can be completely unhelpful for another person. But there's also the flip side of, yeah, I can get up and do my morning meditation and read 30 pages of my book and do this. And then, you know, it, it's 11 a.m. and you haven't done anything and you're freaking out about, you know, you haven't got the perfect routine in. When if you had just got up and started working and got into the grind, you would have achieved so much by the same amount of time. Totally, yeah. And my my routine's not like super optimized and uh, repetitive. So this morning I got up at about ten to six and got into work within you know fifteen minutes, and uh, it was great. But you know, yesterday I slept in a bit and started work at nine. You know, so it's it's not necessarily about getting the most optimized routine for every single person. It's finding what works best for you, and um, and being disciplined within that framework. Yeah. Now, this is a completely off-the-cuff question for you, Johnny, and this is something I think some of our listeners who may have been in the game for a bit longer may experience, but I definitely know when I first like read Think and Grow Rich and discovered entrepreneurship and all these kind of books, I was on fire and I didn't sleep for more than four hours a night for about two years because I was just so on fire, so motivated, so eager to make something of myself. And that kind of feeling of wishing to go back to that and how do I discover the next coolest book? Or, you know, I'd read finance book after finance book. They all had the same information, just explained in slightly different ways, but I was still searching to try and get that buzz or that kind of, that addictive feeling of, yes, I'm self-improving. Have you experienced a similar thing yourself? And do you have any experience around that? Yeah, I have. And um, it's definitely a trap. And I've seen it in the way that I came to realize that is I've got friends that are, are like that who haven't done anything with the information and so they'll just keep reading and going to conferences and paying all this but not actually progressing and so I think the thing that you need to do to snap out of that trap is you focus on what's the next hurdle so for you if the next hurdle is how do I hire my first teacher well that's the next hurdle that's the only thing you should be focusing on is that one thing how do I hire my next my next you know teacher or my first teacher so you're looking, well, who has that knowledge? Is it your accountant? Is it, is it Michael? Is it myself? Uh, who's, who's going to be the person that will get you that result the fastest? And then you work on that. And then there'll be another, that'll open a door to seven new problems, and then you work on them. So thinking about your professional development in terms of what is the next hurdle that I'm facing, because there's no point reading, um, you know, 
these massive, you know, Fortune 500 company books when the next thing you need to do is just hire your first teacher and learn how to set up a contractor and pay tax so you're within the law. Yeah, that's a really, really solid advice there. And no point trying to improve one area of business by 1% when you don't really need it, <laughs> when you can just go out for the, you know, the big 80% effective things and, and work in the zone of what your business needs at the time. Yeah, yeah. Still still keep some stuff for inspiration, you know, while you're going for a jog or washing the dishes and stuff. But when you're actually in your focused, like I'm in the zone, working hard now, yeah, focus on the things that move you forward. Excellent. And when you first started Good Time, I know it was by the sounds of a drum academy year, obviously we're thinking in a certain way, but did you ever envision it would go to a seven-figure business or even a multiple seven-figure business at this point? No, not at the start. I thought that you know, 100 students would be amazing as a drum school. That would be incredible, you know. And then you think, oh, wow, we got to 100. Maybe we could get to 500. And so basically your vision just grows and grows. And so if, pardon me, if you if you listen to my story and you think, oh, well, I'll never do that, um, why bother? It's this similar thing of watching some incredible, you know, 12-year-old Asian kid play the most incredible, you know, song on the piano that you can't do uh, and you think you should give up. That's not the case. Like you you chase the next goal for you and some people that's going to be a student number, some people it's going to be a money number, some people it's going to be a lifestyle goal like, I, you know, I've reached 70 grand a year or 100 grand a year but I'm working 50 hours so maybe the next goal for you is I want to keep my 100 grand a year but I want to work 20 hours how would I do that so I think your vision grows as you grow and you set different targets and goals for what's special to you and you try really hard not to compare to other people fantastic and I know you've already mentioned your mindset change and a, a few different things in the personal development world but what had to change for you and you've even coached a few people like this. So what separates five-figure music teachers, six-figure music teachers, seven-figure music teachers, and or business owners? What have you noticed um, having probably catered to people at all three of those levels? Yes, lots of things. The first one that just jumps into my mind right now is um, is a hard one for people to learn. But the more successful that you become in your business, kind of the le- the less accessible you have to become. Not totally, and I know that can sound cold and harsh, but if you think about um, if every single person who asked you for money, you gave it to them, you would have no money left. And so the same in your business. If every single person asked you for half an hour or an hour of your time, you would literally have no time left. If you said yes to every student, yes to every meeting, yes to every coffee date, yes to every social event. And so I think there is a level of dedication and, um, you know, discipline saying no to certain things. Um, we mentioned before the podcast, we've been trying to pin this down for a while. I had had to say no a couple of times just because there's so many other, uh, you know, important things going on. So I think if you are operating at that kind of five figure level, one of the disciplines you need to look at is, again, your value of your time and how you think about weighing up what you put your time into and it doesn't mean say no to everyone or be rude or anything like that or think that you're high and mighty but if you want to do big things like you can't be uh you know stepping over dollars to pick up pennies yeah oh that's such a great expression i haven't heard that one before i'm pretty sure every little quote that i say has been stolen from someone else in some book that i've read so um don't think i'm amazing but they're good sayings yeah yeah, that's an excellent one and a very important lesson. And yeah, you guys have been totally honest in, in saying that I've been trying to reach out to Johnny for over a year to get this thing happening. And I'm very grateful for the fact that now is finally the right time. Yeah, sorry um, about that. Totally risk. If he had kept me waiting for five years, I would have kept on asking him at least once a year. Never give up, always be persistent. But that's what I'm sure is part of your success there, Johnny, is being able to identify what opportunities need your attention at this point in time and then just throwing your focus behind those. Mm, that's good. Now, how did you go about growing Good Time Academy to its current level? Yeah, so the key thing is about finding the right people along the way. I know that sounds, you know, cliche and simple, but it really is. You have to you have to look at everything that you do and you have to basically decide what all those hats are that you wear. 
And you need to kind of group them and start looking for people that can take on those responsibilities who can either already be better than you at those things, let's say it's administration, or have the potential to be better than you at those things. And then you have to be willing to hand those things over and look at the amount of free time that you've created once those people were uh, trained up in those roles. So if you were doing 20 hours of admin and you hand it off to an assistant, uh, you've, you're going to spend the next you know two or three months maybe training them up and getting them fully sufficient in the role, but then you've freed up 20 hours. So that 20 hours literally has to provide uh, the, the work that you're going to do with that 20 hours needs to cover your wage plus their wage now uh, and some growth for the business. So every time you replace something and hand it down, you're looking for what's a more valuable thing to do. And usually that's going to be in the marketing space, also in the team building space uh, and other opportunities that are going to bring more revenue in for the music school. So that's how I was sort of thinking about things. And uh, so I would start with things like the administration, lots of the lower level stuff that I wasn't the best at, I would hand that off. Um, teaching, the goal was over time to get myself out of teaching because then at the first step, well, I can be a reliever if someone's sick. So that's great. I can also go and observe the teachers and give them feedback because I've, you know, I've kind of mastered the craft and so I can pass on what I know to them, help them get better. And so now you've freed yourself up to work on the business and be developing a team. And that's pretty much the process. It sounds, um, you know, I make it sound simple, but it's how do you just continually do yourself out of a job and reinvest the time that you've freed up into more valuable things? And so if you look at my journey and, you know, read some of the story on our website and things like that, you'll, you'll see the different ventures we did building charitable trusts and raising hundreds of thousands of dollars there, building other, you know, online programs in the music space, um, you know, launching new locations, moving up to bigger buildings, building music buses, running international camps, all the crazy stuff that we did. I wouldn't be able to do it if I just, uh, if I held tightly to everything that I was already doing. And and the other lesson I just want to say in there is for the person that's, um, you know, nervous about handing things on, that they think that they're the best in the world at this and no one could ever do it like them. That may actually be true. Maybe no one can do it like you, but they could do it 80% as good as you. And maybe you can train them and get them from, you know, maybe 60 to 80% to up to, you know, 85% or 90%. You're still better off being able to push forward and do that than holding on tightly to everything because otherwise you fall into the trap of, owning a job and thinking you're an entrepreneur, but you're not, you just own a job. That was a bit of a long answer, but I hope there's some something interesting in there for you. <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of t great things and everyone, if you don't have your pen and paper, go get it now because Johnny, I'm sure, is going to give us tons of other little nuggets of gold there. And he's absolutely right, just systematically replacing yourself, uh, growing the business and not holding on to it too long. That's something I can definitely reflect upon and go, the first couple of hires, I was so worried about people not being as good a teacher or not being – in, in many cases, it turned out they were just as good, if not better, in other areas. And hiring where I was deficient has now almost become like a rule of thumb in terms of here's all the areas where I could have improved, so let's hire someone who's already good at those things. And that's been amazingly powerful as well. Yeah. I'll just add to that. If you, if you hire people that are also humble and teachable, if they lack the skills and you actually train them up, and give them the skills, there is a real sense of loyalty there with most good, humble, teachable people. And they will become some of your best team members and stay for years if you treat them well. Yeah, that's really, really important. And one of the big failures I made early on was trying to hire the best guitar player and hope that they're a good teacher. But there was a correlation between, and not trying to offend anyone here, but there was a huge correlation between technical wizardry and poor social skills where you had a whole bunch of really great bedroom musicians who could play anything, but when it came time to explain things, they forgot what it was like to be a beginner. They really struggled to break it down into terms and were just like, why can't this kid practice three hours a day just like I did and get really good? So it was this complete disconnect. And the solution was finding people who were great communicators and great people, uh, people and then just giving them better guitar playing skills and teaching skills. And as you said, they really appreciated the fact that I was giving them all these guitar lessons to build their skills up and that better equipped them for what they needed in my business and where I was not the best communicator, a bit more on the uh, the bedroom wizardry side of things, um, 
filling out those spots on the bench with teachers who are much better suited and could socialize with people a lot more than I like to do worked out really well. That was sort of our recipe for success there. Yeah, totally. And it will change their lives, which is awesome. So there's nothing more rewarding than giving someone a job that they love and being able to, you know, pay their rent or feed their family or, you know, get in, get their first car, whatever it is. So Johnny, from my understanding was you ended up uh, getting out of your music school entirely uh, and finding a buyer and selling it, which is the dream of maybe not so much many a music teacher, but the dream of an entrepreneur is to build a business that's successful and then sell it onto someone else. So can you uh, confirm if I'm right in my assumptions there and let me know about the process if it is true that you went about it? Yeah, yeah. So I um, I launched Good Time Music Academy in 2009 with the 30 students and then built it up to the 2000 and in about 2019 sold it at the end of that year. Um, totally not knowing that there would be a world pandemic showing up, you know, a month or two later. So that was uh, crazy timing. And so, yeah, I sold it to a friend, uh, Andy, who um, is someone I went to university with and had built another music school about an hour away with about 500 students, I think. And so he was kind of, you know, the the one that won the bid for the school in the end, which I was very happy about. And he's done amazing things and I'm still, you know, involved a little bit. So yeah, that's that's how I sort of ended up um, building it up and moving it on. Now, maybe Andy's the one to ask this question, but if someone was w- wanting to buy a music school, how do they go about, I'm assuming they get a loan or was he just in a, a really favorable position where he had the money lying around to be able to invest? Well, I think it's, it depends what size it is because along my journey, I bought I bought a solo teacher's practice and absorbed it into our school. I bought another music school competitor and absorbed it into ours. And so there are people that will buy them for different, um, you know, different prices and sizes and be able to have the cash, which I did at the time for, for those acquisitions. But for something the size of good time, you're going to, well, unless you've got a lot of money, um, you're going to need to, you know, get some bank support. So I, I have actually filmed a whole training talking all about this and people can grab it free if they want um, at buildamusicschool.com. It's located in module eight and I break it all down and I share everything around the process, even some of the tough emotional stuff around preparing yourself for it. And uh, But yeah, you have to prepare all the documents legally and, you know, draw up, you know, big contract. Uh, but it can it can be done. And I've helped many other people sell their music schools in the last few years, uh, one of our BAM squad members has just sold hers and is just waiting out for the handover date and hasn't announced it to everyone yet. But, uh, you know, in about two weeks' time, she'll be handing over the keys and it will surprise everyone. But, yeah, it's a really cool thing to know that you can build a business, build it up so that it can succeed you and you actually get paid, you know, a nice chunk of money at the end if you do it right so that it's not just you get to the end of your time like so many amazing music teachers and they go, I'm going to retire now. And then they just hand off all their business and list of students and all the goodwill they've built up to all the other teachers in the area for free and don't get any reward to you know take them onto their next journey or into retirement. So something to think about. Yeah, that's some uh, amazing stuff there and, and really amazing timing. It's like just to think the whole world went to hell in a handbasket there right at the end of 2020 and to sort of I mean, it wasn't a total walk away, so I'm sure you were involved and had some work to do and and were doing all those kind of things. But if it had been a total walk away, it would have been just like <laughs> the exact right thing to do at the right time. Like, where's your crystal ball, Johnny? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, um, I, was, I was shocked. It looked like I had inside knowledge. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. And what's your day-to-day involvement or, or involvement in Good Time Academy at this point? So at the moment, it's not a huge amount. We have a charitable trust that I built, which runs alongside the the profitable business arm. And that's what I set up to help um, kids that couldn't afford lessons. And so that trust, I believe, I need to check the numbers. I think we will have raised over a million dollars now since it started. And we, so I moved to being chairman of the board of that trust. And so it's more just uh, on that governance level, helping um, the team there make sure that we're ticking the right boxes and staying within the law and chasing the vision of helping these kids and securing funding and things like that. So I'm I'm kind of involved whenever they need me. I'm a phone call away and I show up to, you know, board meetings and I won't do that forever, but it's cool to still be involved and see them going from strength to strength. Yeah, fantastic. Are you still, because I think at some point in time you were running the Build a Music School program out of the same premises. Is that still the case or have you sort of moved out of there? 
yeah, we don't run it there anymore. Uh, we we realised uh, we don't need this massive studio for what we're doing. People actually want to, you know, sit face to face. I'm not sure if most people will be watching or listening to this uh, on audio or video, but it's it's very much, uh, you know, I'm I'm right in your face like you are, Michael, and it feels more personable. So we realised we don't actually need a massive studio. So uh, I actually converted uh, a space in at my house, so I'm able to film here and uh, don't need the big space. That's fantastic. You can get all the luxuries of working from home, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, oh, totally. The dogs love it. They get, you know, 15 games of fetch a day. Yeah, and there's nothing like having a yeah the, the office dog to keep you company throughout the day as well. Totally. If I wasn't doing music, I'd be doing something with, uh, you know, helping dogs. Now, this is a dangerous point in the conversation where we could completely derail to talking about our pet dogs, so we're going to come back on track. Uh, speaking of, of business and all these kind of things, so what are some essential lessons or really valuable insights you picked up along the way which you would hold as you know maybe the, the best things the listeners should pay attention to? Oh, man, good question. Um, okay, well, here's, here's a couple top of my head. I think the first one is that you can actually just go bigger than you really think. Like I think most musicians think too small. They think they've been, you know, they've had a lifetime of people telling them it's just a hobby or it's something they'll always be broke or it'll always just be a hobby or a, a passion business. I don't think that's true, and I think you need to stop listening to that sort of rhetoric. I think you can build things much bigger than you think, and that idea I talked about earlier of just having a bigger vision and always thinking about what you can do next and being inspired by that and then just getting to work I never dreamed of, you know, building, you know, two thousands student music school and selling it. And now, um, you know, there's about th now we've got about three hundred and fifty music schools or something around the world, and and in our BAM squad, it's our build a music school community, showing them what we've done and helping them do it a bit, you know, easier and less stressful. And so I think uh, that most people need to just think a little bit bigger and really just go for it. So that would be the first thing I'd say. The second thing I've hinted at already is you really need to be thinking who, not how. So whenever you're trying to get over the next hurdle and you're trying to grow and something seems too big and scary, it's not necessarily how can I learn to do that. That is the slow way. It's, um, you know, you can learn to do everything, but it's it's always going to be limited. It's always going to be smaller. So if you think about the who, well, who has those skills? Who's been through that before? Who... Who could I hire to do this? Who could I fast track this with? Who could I contract in? If you think like that and invest a little bit of money into the who, rather than spending all the time on the how and figuring it out yourself, you will go faster. And so that becomes an issue of like, well, how fast do you want to go? If you've got a big goal, if you want to have your own music school or 100 private students and group lessons at your house, whatever it is, if you want to get there faster, you'll get there faster with people that are going to support you who have done it before and they are the yeah they're the ones that are going to shortcut that whole journey for you um third thing i'd say is like get into a really good mastermind group it's something musicians basically don't do i'd never thought about it until um i started you know building businesses but it's been one of the single most valuable things i've ever done so a mastermind group is where you basically get together with you know might be 3 4 7 other business owners in your industry who you're not in competition with so they're not going to be the local people but you're sharing like hey this is my biggest challenge right now has anyone been through this and can help me or hey i i need a resource that's going to overcome this challenge can has anyone already built that and then you're sharing and helping each other um, and it just grows and grows. So I've been in several groups and the best groups are always the ones where you're the dumbest guy in the room. <laughs> and um, I'm I'm in a mastermind now. I've been in the last two or three years and it's incredible. Like every every week I feel like I should have paid $1,000 to be there. So the top guy actually, because you guys are all um, guitarists listening, most of you, right? So, so the top guy in our group is um, Scott from Scott's Bass Lessons, who's got like 26 or 28,000 base students online. So um, he's incredible. And then there's there's five of us and everyone in that group is just absolute killers. So that would be a massive thing is getting into mastermind groups. So whether they're in a, in a group like with uh, with your community, what you do and the BAM squad, they all get masterminds free as part of their membership. That's going to be huge value to you. So yeah, think bigger, 
think about the the who, not the how, and get into a mastermind. That would be three of the biggest things to make you go further faster. That's some really, really awesome advice. And man, we got got to get Scott on the podcast if he's up to those kind of numbers. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I can I can do an intro for you if you um if you want to give it a shot. Yeah, that'd be awesome. But we'll, we'll talk about that once we get off the air here. Um, I, I definitely want to ask you a bit more about your transition into the online coaching, but maybe just a few more things on on the actual brick and mortar kind of business here. What's three ways our listeners can grow their studio? Okay, so you want like some some marketing hacks or ways to kind of think about it generally? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. So if what would be the most practical first steps? Maybe we can even segment and say, if, if you were just getting started out, what's one bit of advice? If you're someone with 20 or 30 students wanting to go to the next level, what's uh, another thing you could do or, or most recommended thing? And if you've got a bigger music score and you're, you, know, you are chasing down those multiple six-figure, seven-figure numbers, what are some things you should be doing at each level? Okay. Well, let me give you, um, this is like my framework and how I teach it, and this will be valuable for anyone at any level. So I use the acronym BILLIONS. So um, if you want to have that like billionaire type marketing, here's what you want to think through. So B, brand. So you don't want to position it all around yourself as the expert. You want to build a brand. So for us, it was Good Time Music Academy, not the Johnny Wilson show, you know. So build a brand, and then you people are more uh, willing to be part of a brand and, you know, uh, grow that in the community. Um, I stands for inspire. So a lot of people miss this part where you've actually, um, you've got to go inspire people to want to learn an instrument who aren't even thinking about it. So the biggest, single biggest thing we did was get out into schools and perform. Nothing has beaten it. Our record was 155 new students in one day from a school of 400 kids. Uh, we never beat that, but we had multiple days where we attracted more than 100 students in a day. So get out and inspire the kids. You remember what it was like looking at your heroes playing an instrument, and if at the end if they um, actually said, hey, you want to come and hang out with me every week and uh, you know learn how to drum or play guitar, uh, you would have signed up. So get out there and inspire people, uh, not just shows, but also uh, it's the whole concept is people that aren't even thinking about it. So it can be local Facebook community groups, can be your social media stuff inspire them. So what are we up to? B-I-L, uh, looking for L. So you want to be found when people are actually looking. So that's going to be sorting out your SEO on your website, sorting out Google ads. So when people are actually looking for, you know, hey, Guitar Lessons Melbourne, they find you. Next one, L is lead nurture. You want to be collecting actual leads. So uh, you want to have people, you know, signing up for little lead magnets or info packs about your lessons. So you actually get a name, email, phone number. And if they sign up, great. If they don't, you're able to nurture those leads, sending them, you know, little deals each month or uh, newsletters about what you're up to, special events, promotions, like nurture those people because they may not sign up now. Don't give up on them because uh, we have people that join the BAM squad that have been following us for three years. And they're like, well, you just mentioned this one new resource. We want that. And now we're, now we're on board. And we waited three years. If we gave up after the first three days, yeah. And sorry, Johnny, I just want to jump in there because our listeners might find this as a really great example. I probably came across the BAM squad marketing, I don't know exactly when, maybe at the end of 2019, start of 2020 or thereabouts. And that's when I sort of come across it and thought, oh, this looks interesting, but I'm in another program at the moment, so I'm not going to take a look at that. And then a couple months later, I got a few more emails, got a really great offer, which is too good to refuse. So I come on board to the BAM squad for a month or two. Uh, I think it was like get access to everything for $1,000 or something. And as you said before, I should be paying tens of thousands of dollars for this information, but a 1000 bucks is just too good a deal. So I jumped on it and I was in there, went through all the modules. The content is absolutely fantastic. And if you're looking for a recommendation or a reason to to uh, go into Johnny's program, like it is absolutely fantastic and I highly recommend it. The whole point of what I'm saying right now is, and I emailed you about this, Johnny, is I went through my inbox and I, I typed in John to find someone's thing. And I had an email, like a contact form from maybe two or three years earlier, where Johnny had actually reached out to me through the contact form on my website saying, hey, I'm a uh, music school coach, just wondering if you need help with anything. So he'd obviously reached out three or four years prior to me discovering your stuff that you were putting out on the internet at the time. And then uh, it's taken you three years to get the sale or to make that contact or for me to find the thing that 
finally resonated with me, but you, you had everything in place and you continued to follow up over a couple of years and you finally got the sale. Oh, that's so cool to hear. Yeah, and it's worth doing. And the other thing is you can automate it as well. So you can, you know, there's plenty of softwares that will just put that stuff on a drip. And so, you know, you're sending different things, dif- different people over, you know, up to years if you need to. So that is something to definitely implement. It sounds exhausting the way that I'm explaining it now, but uh, it's, it's just that idea of like nurturing your leads uh, because, yeah, long term, it is definitely worth um, sending those emails out. Do you want me to carry on with the? Uh, yeah, I think we, we just did the second L, so we'd love to hear the rest of that acronym. Yeah, well, that flows on to the next one really well. The next one is um, I for incentives. Incentives. So there's this fun study that was done where people were lining up at a, like a photocopier, and they asked people, "Hey, can I cut in?" And most people would say, "No, no, get to the back of the line." But if people said, Hey, can I cut in? I've actually, I've got a meeting in five minutes. I've got to have this done. And it like 80, 90% of the people uh, said that they could cut in, you know? And so it's that simple reminder in marketing, like you want to have an incentive. And so you want to be not just sending emails for the sake of it, but you want to like think about, well, what can I send? Oh, well, uh, what are we in now? It's March as we record this. Um, hey, it's March Madness. Uh, we're, we're doing this crazy deal where you pay for one lesson, you get... You can get another one free, you know, um, and then uh, maybe it's fantastic February or it's, you know, Independence Day or it's your school's birthday and things like that. So you look for opportunities to put deals in front of people and you always shape the deal in a different way, you know. So we're about to do a, a little launch and a, and a deal to our list because we just finished our, our BAM Squad conference. And so we filmed all the incredible workshops and talks from uh, guest speakers and myself. So, hey, if you join this month, you're going to get this incredible package for free, you know? So, uh, incentives, that's a big one. Any thoughts on that one, Michael? Will I get the next one ready? No, I just uh, thought swirling around. I don't know if our listeners are doing the same thing, but March Madness, straight away, I've got to put out a sale, I've got to put out an email. <laughs> and um, Yeah, yeah, true. Having almost like a, some companies do this and it probably drives you nuts, but any reason to have a sale or a membership special, uh, and this is something I learned from Grant Carter, and is if it's Valentine's Day, even if it's completely unrelated to your industry, have a Valentine's Day sale, which kind of makes a good gift card pack if you're a music school owner. If it's, um, if it's uh, what have we got coming up this week? Um, St. Patrick's Day. Is there a St. Patrick's Day special? Like any excuse to... Um, I even heard Alex Hormozzi saying something along the lines of, in college, you have any excuse to drink or have a party. In marketing, you've got any excuse to have a sale and, and ask for the sale. So that's something which ties into that incentives there. Totally. And um, and you just got to really mix up the the offers. So don't do lame offers like 10% off or 15% off. It's like, heck, go buy two movie tickets. And, and be like, if you sign up this month, you get two free movie tickets, you know, Um Find ways to just cover the cost of that in the package that you sell to get people started and, you know, refresh it every month. So that's um, that's I for incentives. So we've done B-I-L-L-I and then O is outreach. So we would um, think about ways at good time for how do we outreach into the community. So we do big events like talent quests with sponsor certain events. We get out into, you know, Facebook community groups. How are we outreaching? And so there's a whole lot of ways you can be doing that, even if you're just teaching on your own, getting out into the community. In a similar approach is networking. And so this is a big one as you grow is who do you need to network with to propel your business forward? So a key one for us early on was schools. So how do we connect with school principals and head teachers and music teachers? And then it became, hey, how do we connect with local figures? Like there's lots of photos at our school with, you know, the mayor coming to visit and the local politicians and eventually the the minister of education and uh, the prime minister, two different prime ministers, uh, two different times uh, and so you're working your way up to these local people and you're you're using their networks and you're using their you know their image and stuff on on ads and marketing uh, even think simpler if you're, you're not going to get the you know the president of the United States to go to your school but hey can you get the local dance school owner to come and do a partnership with you who are you networking with newspapers there's so many people that um, will help you uh, grow by expanding into other, you know, family bases and networks, things like that. So that's N. Uh, last one is S for super fans. So basically, you got to turn your students into super fans. So you set up really great referral programs for them, ones that they actually 
care about and want to participate in. Um, you run special events for them regularly where they get to bring friends and there's competitions for that. You get them doing testimonials and sharing cool videos and you repurpose that for all your ads and marketing. And, um, you know, you can even do affiliate sort of uh, bonuses and things if you want to. So that's that's basically billions. There's there's heaps of ideas for you. But what what trap people get into a lot of the time is just thinking, oh, this guy says I should do Google Ads. So that it's all about Google Ads. It's like, n- no, Google Ads are great if you're looking, uh, you know, if it's Google Search because there's different types. Well, those are only going to be driven by the amount of people actually looking, and that's one spoke to your wheel. But you want to make sure you have a diversified marketing strategy, and that's what um, I was building, and that's what worked and got us to 2,000 students. That's a really great little insight to tag on the end there because – Different things are going to work with different kind of people, different seasons, different markets. I know in my own coaching program, what works really great for the Australian and English students just doesn't work for the Americans as well. And different geographical areas have got their own culture and, you know, the American style hard selling doesn't work that great here in Australia and maybe similar to you over on the other side of the pond there. So it's just about adapting and figuring things out. And uh, that goes along with your message as well. What kind of message are you putting out with? Who does it resonate with? And what kind of people are you trying to attract? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really good thought. Now, in terms of the actual teaching things, and I'm still kind of reeling from that magnificent acronym you gave us in billions there, maybe just as a bit of a change of pace so people can, <laughs> their heads don't explode from all the uh, the awesome, uh, dare I say, gold that you're dropping there. In terms of um, group lessons and retention, so this is something that I know uh, sometimes it's really good and sometimes it really drops off a bit. And the more people we have in the studio, the more it grows, the more slightly disconnected we get. Uh, How have you navigated group lesson programs and retention in group lessons? Yeah, good question. So I I actually gave a talk at um, our BAM Squad conference on this two weeks ago. Um, We had about 40 people come from around the world and we did a week in New Zealand and one of the sessions was on uh, retention and I called it realistic retention, your passport to profit. And so we all know that uh, one of the ways to grow your profit is to improve your retention, but you have to be realistic about it. There, there are people that are going to leave. They, they are going to have different life you know, circumstances. They, are gonna, they actually aren't suited right for your program. There isn't magic formulas to make everyone stay forever. So you've got to be realistic first, but there are things that you can do. And so uh, again, like um, the passport was an acronym that I use. So if I can remember it, P, performance opportunities. It's really essential to to have performance opportunities for your students and together as, uh, you know, groups be working towards those and making those really special. So those are, you know, yeah, a special events that they look forward to, work towards, have a goal, and you celebrate as well afterwards. A becomes like attention to detail with the students. The bigger you get, the easier it is to let that personal attention kind of slip a bit. When you just teach, you know, 30 kids on your own, you know every student, every parent's name, you're prepared to take, you know, unlimited texts and calls during the week and and it's just you. Uh, But as you grow and you get, you know, 100 students, 200, 500, that attention and that feeling of like a small business uh, sort of feel can diminish. And so you have to be thinking about how do we make sure we continue to give people that small business feeling and attention. Uh, S would stand for a squad. You know, we've got our BAM squad. That's a, a community. And so how do you build that kind of squad feeling within your students? So uh, are students only meeting, you know, the student and the lesson before them and after them? Or are you doing things to actively make them feel part of something? You know, one of the things that I wish I would have figured it out early uh, at good time was some sort of cool community nickname, which, you know, like Build a Music School, we've got the BAM squad and people have all got their, their T-shirts and merch and they wear it with pride. So think, is there something you can do with your studio to create a community around it? Because I think people really do come for the content, you know, the lessons and that experience, but they stay for the community because they make friends, they enjoy all the cool things that you do. So how do you continue to boost that outside of lessons? Next S, is surveys. You actually got to ask people how they're feeling. A lot of us feel like we're just working so hard and we don't want any feedback because we know it all. We already know what's broken, but that's not the point. Even if you knew everything you needed to work on, you didn't ask people. And so set a calendar reminder to survey people to sort of say, hey, 
uh, the most simple survey we would do is, hey, tell us one thing that we're doing really well and one thing that we could improve on. Just by saying that gives people a nice, easy framework to say something encouraging and to give something uh, constructive, and then you can take it away and have a read and decide on a few things that you need to work on, and uh, you'll be surprised at what comes through, and people uh, feel appreciated uh, because you've taken the time to listen. And then when you report back, you can say, hey, thanks so much for the feedback. We had lots of great responses. Here's the seven things that you said that we've implemented. We're still working on a few others. Uh, we really appreciate it. And then you set that in your calendar, you know, every year to do that. What are we up to? P-A-S-S-P, pipeline. Uh, a really cool thing that we implemented was a student development pipeline. So that's not just like working through grades or karate belts or levels or earning badges or stickers. It's actually kind of a pipeline of the experiences and opportunities that you can develop. So we had everything from, you know, our Tiny Tones classes with preschool kids, where Kids could learn on the music bus in schools. They could work their way up to private lessons. They could play in a band. They can play concerts. Um, they can uh, perform in a talent quest. They can become, we even had a whole intern program. Uh, we even had jobs. And so there was this whole pipeline that we had displayed and there were lots of steps on it. And students could see, oh, this is where I am at now. This is what I can work my way up to. So think about the things that you're already doing and how can you actually put that into kind of a roadmap or a pipeline for students uh, so they can see the journey that they're on. And you're giving them a vision that's bigger than what they're thinking about. They're thinking, I just want to learn how to play the guitar. But you're actually saying, hey, you're going to learn how to play the guitar. You're also going to learn how to back a singer. You're going to learn how to play a band. You're going to learn how to perform in a talent quest. You're going to play in the teacher's band. You know, you're going to work your way up to volunteering on um, this program that helps kids that can't afford it. Maybe every now and then is a social enterprise type thing. Whatever you're doing, uh, create an on map, a, a roadmap, a pipeline, and a vision for those students. Uh, a couple more. O stands for onboarding. Just think through the process of how you onboard a student, literally every step from the, you know, the way that the car pulls up and where they park. Have you actually told people, park here, here's the instructions, here's a little video of how you get to the door. Uh, and then right through to, we had little cool little gift packs where we give them, you know, their favorite chocolate bar, some cool flyers and info packs. Um, we would make sure that we introduce them to every student in the hallway as we pass other students and parents. Uh, you know, just think about that whole onboarding experience. Do you follow up people? Um, make that incredible. Uh, two more. Ah, resources. You got to have good resources. I know you've got awesome resources, Michael, and so you can't be doing scrappy bits of paper and um, here just download this thing. And yeah, you've got to have something that looks good. And it's so easy these days. Heck, even I know you've got something people can kind of um, you know slap their logos on. So do we. So grab stuff like that that's cost tens and tens of thousands to build and use it and tweak it to make it your own. Have professional looking resources. If you've got a team, supply them with the right tools and resources they need to do a good job, train them. And then T of Passport is teaching. you got to make sure people, of course, are great teachers, and that involves ongoing teacher training. We would do observations with each teacher. We would sit and talk about it and, and give them feedback. Uh, and we would have a training program for every teacher that comes in to learn how to teach. We call it Teaching Matters, and we give that away as well. So that's the passport, performance opportunities, attention to detail, squad, surveys, pipeline, onboarding, resources, and teaching. And if you get those things in place, your retention will absolutely rock it. Johnny, thanks so much for sharing that. And, and to the listeners, I just want to tell you right here, right now, if you haven't done Johnny's program, the amount of value in what he's telling you is just astronomical. And I have a feeling part of Johnny's marketing strategy is just give and give and give and give, and hopefully people will be reciprocal to that. So please head to Johnny's website right now. If you haven't signed up or you've been on the fence about it, hit that sign up button because you won't regret it. So where can our listeners go and find your stuff, Johnny? Yeah, so just go to buildamusicschool.com and on there there's a seven-day free trial and we literally unlock our entire library for you. So there's things in there that actually, like I'm serious, cost us tens of thousands of dollars. We just we just build on a trust system. We know that people that will come in if they want to steal things and uh, run away, we know they won't succeed anyway, so we actually don't care if people do that. So if that's you, 
you you feel free to come and do that. But the, we know that the serious people stick around because um, they see the value. So if you've heard something that I'm talking about, you want to see it in detail, see stacks of examples, um, as well as hundreds of other things, just go grab a seven-day trial and, um, yeah, you'll be blown away with what's available there to you. And having seen whatever the library looked like, maybe two and a half, three, or 2020, I think it was, uh, when I – I had a look at it. I'm sure tons of great resources have been added that it's been refined and there's the experience of uh, maybe an additional 200 or so members have joined the program and, and had their contribution as well. And so I'm sure that's helped you sharpen your axe there, Johnny, and keep on delivering great content. Yeah, we don't want to get um, get stale. There's so much to so much to teach and, so, and it, yeah, it just gets better every day. And it is a very different world teaching now than what it was three years ago. Obviously, we had the pandemic and lockdowns. And I know in my home city of Melbourne, we've probably had the worst lockdowns in the world. And and a lot of your ones in New Zealand were pretty similar. Um, so I'm sure there's a ton of great content to help people re-navigate the rebuilding phase. And while the worst of it is past, there's still, at least here in Melbourne, there's still a reluctance and a hesitance from the general consumer. And, and that might be somewhat influenced by the threat of uh, you know the the Ukraine situation at the moment and all this inflation and the fallout of being locked down for for two years. So if you don't have a mentor, as Johnny said, one of the best things you can do is get a mentor or a mastermind who can help you navigate these scenarios. So you know we've got tons of great resources at Top Music. I've got my Guitar Ninjas and Six Figure programs. Johnny's got his Builder Music School. It doesn't matter who you go with, the advice is going to be great. And if you can resonate with one particular person over the other, try them all out. Pick who resonates with you the best. But Johnny's program is absolutely world class. I will. I will add. They're not all great. The three you mentioned are great. There are some. There are some dodgy ones and some fake gurus out there, which you're aware of, and we don't need to name and shame. But just do your research on: Is this a person that's actually achieved this stuff, or they've just read a few books and are making it up? But start with the three Michael mentioned, and you'll be set. You know. Yeah, that's really interesting because I almost put in a question and I mentioned on the previous podcast that I don't necessarily uh, script out every word that we talk about, but I do like to send you a couple of questions to give you some thought prompts and things like that. But I was actually going to ask, and this might segue into the next question about uh, how you got involved in online teaching, but at what point or what really makes someone a fake guru and at what point do people qualify to actually give some of the advice and the business coaching. Yeah, good question. I'm happy to riff on that off, off the cuff if you want. Yeah, let's go for it because <laughs> I think it's a valuable lesson for people to learn. Well, the first thing I'd say is there's there's people that have maybe uh, done done the thing, achieved the stuff, and they might just not be the type of person you connect with or want to learn from. That's very different to the person that would say, "Hey, I'm going to um, I'm going to help you grow your music studio to any size." but they've never actually grown anything past a little group studio in their living room or something like that. So I think that that sort of positioning of, hey, I can build your music school to any size, but I've never actually built a music school. For me, I have no tolerance for those people because I know even my own journey going from zero to 500, I still didn't know what the heck I was doing at 500 students really. i for me, it was probably, you know, maybe I'm a bit slower than other people, but it's kind of once you get to that, for me, that thousand student mark, you're like, yeah, I've, I've got this down. I'm still facing new challenges and learning, but the things that I was thinking back in that zero to 500 were so wrong. And I can see that now. And that, that 1,000 to 2,000 happens twice as fast than the first thousand. So I think um, you just want to, you want to, it doesn't have to be learning from me. I don't care about that at all. I just, I have so many calls. Like I would say one every maybe three weeks of people that have gone and spent five grand here and just had their money wasted. Another guy, I think it was, I won't say names, wasted $8,000. Another guy got talked into a $20,000 program. And so I guess I, my, uh, my tolerance is getting a little bit lower with it because a lot of people eventually find their way to us and they've already had their money wasted. They're already skeptical. You've probably been through this too, right? And and they realize, oh, I should have come here first, but now I've got no money. <laughs> and you're like, hey, I'm going to help you anyway, man. So just just do your research. Like uh, anyone can build a nice website. Anyone can create a, a brand, but uh, go go do the research. So. If you Google Michael, you will see that he's built a successful business. If you Google me, you'll see the same. If you Google Tim Topham, uh, you'll see that. 
And so just do that with anyone that tries to sell you something. Yeah. Uh, and to Is add to that, I think. Is that a way to answer it, Michael? Oh, that's a great tactical way of answering it. Um, and I think on the back of COVID and the lockdowns, like so many people who were looking for something to do and, and trying to improve their situation just took a course on how do I make money online. And they bought a course which just basically said, portray yourself as an expert and it becomes a pyramid scheme. In, in they just say, reframe it as you're a guitar teacher now or you're an online social media guru and now you just create a course and you sell the people into that and that shows them how to create a course and sell the people into that. So it just becomes this pyramid kind of uh, chain and effect where it's the poor leading the blind and it's sometimes there's some great content in there, but once you get past the initial offering, which is often very uh, generic and or often can be really, really wrong, is that there's nothing more to offer and all of a sudden, you know, you've built yourself into a hole, you've taken a whole bunch of bad advice which can severely, you know, limit you or impact you or have enormous repercussions and then they can no longer help you because they haven't done that themselves. So, because they're then as a coach, they're out of their own depth and for anyone who's had a student who is just one step behind you, that's a lot of pressure to be in and to be a coach where you've got people outperforming you in your own program or, or getting some really bad advice, which you may be liable for would be a very tricky situation. You wouldn't want to put yourself in. Yeah, no, that's a really good thought. Yeah, absolutely. So on a more positive note, how did you first transition into build a music school and online business coaching? Yeah, so I had um, a handful of music schools here in New Zealand where I'm based. I'm in Wellington, which is the capital, sort of the middle of the country. Um, we we won a bunch of awards over the years. So I, I was lucky enough to win Young Business Person of the Year Award and I won a Local Hero Medal in our New Zealand of the Year competition. And so those stories got out into newspapers and you know wherever else online. And so I had music schools starting to contact me around the country saying, hey, can you you know, I've got a hundred students or 200 students. Can you, can you coach me and help me? And, and I, you know, love passing on the secrets that I learned. So I started helping four or five people and then it became so demanding. I was like, oh, I can't actually, I was saying no to people. And it almost became like starting the music school all over again. Like I, I got to, I want to help people, but I literally can't teach everyone one-on-one and, you know, people were wanting to, you know, come down to, to Wellington and spend, you know, a couple of days with me and things like that. And, so eventually I realized, well, I probably need to, I'm probably onto something here. I need to actually package what I've learned and, you know, put it in a format where um, people can, if they can't come and spend a few days with me or, you know, see everything, they can at least watch it online and download everything that's been helpful. So that's how, that's how I started. So I looked for, Hey, well, who's the person that's, you know, again, who's the who that can teach me how to do this. And I took a really great course that was, you know, some of the best money I've ever spent in professional development. And that was a uh, tribe by Stu McLaren. And I knew of him because he helped um, Michael Hyatt, who is a successful podcast and as a successful CEO, he helped him build a membership program and I'd watched some of that journey. And so I took his course and I think it was about $3,000. And from there, I, I just did sort of like a beta launch out to the BAM squad members. Uh, well, people that I, invited to be a BAM squad member. I sent a few, I just sent a few cold emails. The very first email that I got back was in capital letters, uh, F off. <laughs> so that was encouraging. Um, yeah, I had a few was, of that too. <laughs> and, and that's totally fine. I'll probably, I don't do cold emails anymore, but, uh, I, um, yeah, we still get people that, you know, don't like you and I don't, I couldn't care less. Um, but yeah, I, I put it out there and I said, Hey, if, uh, if you think you'd like to get access to all this, I haven't built it yet. Um, so you're going to pay a one-time fee and I'll give it to you in three months. you got to trust me. And I think 17 or 18 people signed up and paid $1,500 and they got lifetime access. And so that was, you know, whatever the maths was in New Zealand dollars, I think it was like $38,000. So, and I, so I looked at the budget, was like, right, that's enough to, you know, put some of my team on this and help build it. And, most of those people are still really active today and they just kind of laugh at how much value they've gotten in that last four years. So that, that's kind of the journey. And that so that uh, group of, um, you know, 17, 18 has grown to yeah, 300 and something and continues to grow every day, which is pretty cool. That's amazing. And 
you've obviously explained the initial outreach and how you got your first founding members. How did you go about growing it from your founding members and your initial program up to your maybe your first 50 and 100 and, and various other milestones from there? Yeah, I found that, uh, like you said earlier, the the best tip is to um, to give real value and show that you actually know what you're talking about. So don't don't put out your you know kind of worst stuff for free. Put out your best stuff for free. It doesn't even have to be the best. Just put out good stuff for free and let people you know engage with you. So um, you know your podcast is a great example of this. If people get to know you and enjoy your style and your um, personality, they're gonna want to in you know, invest in what you've got to offer. And so give people an opportunity to learn something valuable from you for free. So I'm talking about like a lead magnet or a video, that sort of stuff. And then just say at the end, hey, we've got this thing over here. It's really cool. Here's what people have said about it. Social proof. Come check it out. I'm just sitting here having a chuckle to myself going, if, if it's all about giving out great stuff for free, then we should both expect a spike <laughs> in our <laughs> membership after this podcast episode comes out. <laughs> Because this has been this has been absolutely phenomenal, Johnny, and I'm I'm just kind of sitting here pinching myself, going, I can't believe he's telling us all these kind of things. Because we've had some fantastic guests, but it always comes with that little bit of guarded um, knowledge where you know they want to say more, but they are that you gotta you gotta go behind the paywall for that. So it's been phenomenal, actually, just sitting here with with you, going, I can't believe he just said that. <laughs> That's like amazing. Oh well, there's I mean, it's still only such a tiny fraction of what's available. So. Um, honestly, reach out anytime and come grab anything for free. Like I do hope you stick around, but if if you can't and you just want to take something, that's totally cool as well because it's there to help people. I never had access to this, so I'd, ra- I'd rather help people. Yeah, uh, and that's been something I, I saw in your message from the very start was it's all about helping the other people and it's going to benefit musicians currently learning who aren't getting the best deal they can. And I always say this, like I remember back to my teacher there were some things he did really great. There were some things he didn't do so great. And for me, I was obsessed from day one. But there were some of the other teachers, students who were like, oh, man, I don't like how he does this. Or you know, I was like, how can you not be obsessed with guitar? It's the best thing in the world. And they sort of said, yeah, he did this, he did that. And it didn't resonate with them the same. And a lot of my friends quit and you know, have since reached out a couple of years later. You know, Every single day, I get people saying, I regret quitting guitar when I was much younger. Not a single person has said to me, I regret starting an instrument or guitar in the first place. Not one. But so many people drop out of it because they don't resonate with their teacher or the lessons weren't good or just there was something lacking. And I'd hate to think how many Mozarts, Beethovens, Jimi Hendrixes, Eddie Van Halens, any famous musicians just didn't eventuate because that person stopped when they were much younger because they didn't resonate with their teacher or had a bad experience. So Anytime we can have an impact on another teacher so that one more person does music for life, even if it's not as a professional level, they just have that instrument to fall back on and pick up when they're feeling down or as a stress reliever or they can bust out one to wall at the, the Christmas party when the, uh, the lights go out and the power goes out, all that kind of, all those dream scenarios get to happen because of us as music teachers. So if we can kind of create more of those experiences for our own students in our community, then that's why we do what we do. Yeah, oh, I love that so much. That's, yeah, couldn't have said it better. So, Johnny, you mentioned a little bit earlier that you just got back from your BAM conference, your first convention. So, do you want to tell us about that? Yeah. Oh, this was absolutely incredible. Like, um, and I can't take all the credit. I've got an amazing team. There's um, about seven of us full time at Build a Music School, and what we did is we we decided to host a conference, but we didn't want to do it where you kind of sit in a stuffy room and take notes for eight hours and, you know, squeeze in some dinner time hanging out with everyone. We wanted to do something totally different in the conference that we wished, you know, I wished that existed when I was growing my studio. And so what we did is we hosted a BAM Squad road trip in New Zealand. So we started in Auckland, top of the North Island, and we we went to, you know, four or five different towns and we had, you know, nice hotel accommodation. We had a real mixture of, you know, keynotes and workshops and professional development sessions where uh, I was speaking and sharing, um, yeah, hopefully some really great stuff. And I had some other speakers. I had a guy, Alistair, who worked with me for seven years. He was there from zero to a thousand students or 1200, I think. And then he moved two hours away and started his own music school. And he went from zero to a thousand students in just uh, under four years. So he did it, you know, we did it in seven years. He did it in four. He's uh, an overachiever. So he came and came and shared for a couple of days. He was incredible. We had, you know, when we talked earlier about how competitors, it's not, 
like it's not me versus you and all this sort of stuff like a lot of people think we actually had the next biggest competitor to good time music academy come and speak uh, my friend jack and he's got a studio of about 350 students and so it's a bit smaller but the cool thing jack's done is that he runs his music school on four hours a week so he's all about super optimized and getting the lifestyle out of it while still making good money. And so he came and shared how he's able to run a music school for, uh, you know, four hours a week and make a six figure plus income. So that was really cool. Uh, so lots of guest speakers. And then the rest of the time we did crazy adventures and uh, we'll have some promo stuff, depending when this goes out, you'll be able to see stuff on our website and uh, build a music school YouTube channel. Take a look at the behind the scenes. It was pretty epic. And you're all invited to the next one if you want to jump on the waiting list. But it was it was crazy. So it was a whole week, crazy adventures, heaps of fun, hanging out, flash hotels, great food. It was cool. Yeah, it sounds like such a fun event. And, and any sort of business conference, if you have been on one, is always a fantastic experience. But to have that combined with a, a road trip and see a bit of the, the New Zealand countryside. And how, how many countries around the world did you have members from visit? Uh, so we had uh, America, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, someone came all the way from Spain. I uh, can't remember where else. Those are the main ones. They're the main areas we have. We do have a lot of members in Europe, but it's such a long way. Most of them are holding out for us to do something closer to home. But, yeah, we had about about 40 people come, I think. I think there was 45 of us with the, with the team, and we hired a big tour bus. And, uh, yeah, so much fun. Yeah. Ah, that sounds amazing. So, yeah, definitely jump on the waiting list, guys. Uh, and in terms of – this is something that I may give the right advice or the wrong advice about, but uh, it would be great to hear your answer here, Johnny, in terms of so many people are wanting that lifestyle and we've been inspired by videos on Instagram and sometimes the fake gurus who portray a, a certain lifestyle of, you know, you can work anywhere you want in the world, have the total freedom, and it's definitely possible – uh, and another thing we did when we talked about the uh, the gurus or coaching is sometimes when you join a program, they'll trot out the person who did it, you know, in six months and became a millionaire. And, you know, they're kind of the exception when everyone else gets much slower results. In my opinion, it is much better to build an offline music school for a variety of reasons than to try and build a an online teaching program. Not that you can't, not that I don't want to talk anyone out of it, but it's just a completely different game. And I think offline business is easy mode where it definitely has its advantages and disadvantages, but uh, the online one is just so much more challenging. So for someone who's like on the fence about do I build an in-person business, do I uh, go online or do I do a hybrid of both, what's your sort of thoughts and feedback on that? Do you want me to just answer like really truthfully and without a filter? Yeah, <laughs> or do you want me to... that's, that's yeah. what we want. I'm just going to give you my honest thoughts, and I've never been asked publicly, but I'll just share my thoughts and um, it will offend some people, but... I don't care. Uh, you asked to tell the truth. I think that if you were running like an online studio and you had students and you're trying to do online the coolest in my town, and then we rock up at your school or any of the events that we run and we get on stage and we do what we do, we're stealing your students within two minutes. I think that's the truth. And so you always have that risk. I think that the online is really great for a lot of adults. Um, and they perhaps, you know, that, that is a good market. Like if you want to build build a great job and have adults around the world, that is a profitable market because they have money and it's more about the convenience. I think that I'm seeing in the hundreds of people we work with that it's way harder to build a successful school with kids online because they're harder to get in front of for marketing. So your marketing is going through the parents Um and music will always be this, you know, tangible, physical, community-based thing that can never be experienced the same way um, online as it can getting in a in a room with a bunch of people making sound and music and songs. So, I think yes, you can definitely build a, a job on the online space. You can definitely build a business, but I think it'll be slower and harder. Um, I think the physical thing goes faster, is more fun, and ultimately you have to decide in terms of lifestyle, what are you chasing? And so it's it's kind of like that. I use an analogy, I think, in at the start of our Build a Music School library where it's like you're climbing a ladder, you know, trying to build your business and 
you want to make sure that when you get to the top of that ladder, you've done it. You actually enjoy the view from the top of the building. You're not looking over and going, oh, I put my ladder against the wrong flipping building. I wish I was over there. And so we actually created this tool where we went in like objectively audited all the different business models. You can get this free on our website, actually. And it looks at all the different types of business models and asks you all the questions that you want to be asking yourself about. Do I want to travel one day? Uh, you know, how much am I you know, passionate about this and that? And ask you so many great questions. Then it assesses all the different models based on, you know, business principles about you know, scalability and profitability and you know, ease to run, but also you can assess yourself on some of those more personal lifestyle questions, and then you can figure out what kind of rating each is given and what will actually best suit you. So there's a bunch of candid thoughts for you, Michael. Yeah, fantastic, Johnny. Now, I could sit around, talk to business and teaching with you all day, but I do understand you've got other things to do and that I am taking way too much of your time. I feel guilty (laughs) for sitting around getting all this stuff, but on behalf of Top Music and all of our listeners, I really do appreciate your time and every bit of wisdom you've shared with us. To bring this one in for landing, what is one last bit of wisdom or advice that you can share with our listeners? Yeah, I'd say um, maybe that last point, like get the business model right, like know what you're working towards, you know, which ladder you, you know, putting you up against which building and just run it at 100 miles an hour. And also just a couple of thoughts around, like, we've talked a lot about, you know, changing the world and impacting students, and that's really important. But also remember when you get on a plane and they do the safety message, they say, hey, put your oxygen mask on, on first so that you can help other people. So I think that most music, musicians and music teachers are actually quite giving and generous and charitable and often they actually forget the part of, you actually do need to be profitable and the the weight that's lifted off your shoulders by having the right model, being profitable, knowing that your finances are taken care of, you've got an emergency fund, you're not stressed out of your mind and you're not living week to week. The benefit of that allows you to be more creative, allows you to have more fun, allows you to do cooler things because you're not stressing all the time. So get those fundamentals right. Work with you know someone like yourself or, or our program. Actually, if you're smart, join both. Um, you'll get You'll get the most out of it. And uh, we've seen the inflation stuff happening. We've seen all the world issues, and you've mentioned a few of them. Depending what country you're in, if if seventy thousand was a good salary once upon a time, it's that salary is probably more like a hundred thousand now. So um, get that stuff right so that you can actually take care of yourself, your family, and do big things. So that's probably what I finish with a more of a practical um, thought. Johnny, thanks so much. That's some really solid advice. And I just wanted to ask, because I know there's a couple of modules that you've put in the Top Music uh, membership site. So not all of our listeners are active members, but for those that are, I do know there's some of your content in there from a couple of years back. Is there currently like a, um, a discount you guys have or an affiliation with Top Music? If there's not, I'll totally just get this edited out the podcast. <laughs> but uh, is there some sort of way we can connect outside of the, uh, the seven-day trial, which I'm going to encourage everyone to check out? Yeah, so um, so Tim has a special link uh, with that. Um, it's an affiliate link, and so I encourage you to click that. But uh, I'm I'm happy to do a, a, like a something generous for your guys if they've made it to the end. Then they need to be rewarded with something. So what can I give them? Um, all right, how about this? The I mentioned the BAMCON conference. We'll be selling all of those those packages, all those talks and things. So if you tell me, hey, I um, I listen to you on this podcast, you email me, just johnny at buildermusicschool.com. Johnny spelled J-O-N-N-Y, no H. Um, I'll send you the the whole package of all those recordings that we'll be selling for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I'll send it to you for free. So uh, you just get in touch with me, but also grab grab a seven-day trial uh, with the link that you'll make available, Michael, and you can tell them where they'd find that. Fantastic. Well, we appreciate that generous offer there, Johnny. And what we'll do is make sure we include all the links to your website, um, the relevant BAM squad, social media, and um, yeah, and where they can reach out to you in our show notes. So Johnny, on behalf of the Top Music community, thank you so much once again for coming on the podcast. It took a year to make happen, but it was well and truly worth the wait. And uh, we look forward to this one coming out very soon. And we'll keep all our Top Music members and uh, mailing list updated with anything else. And and like always, anytime you want to come on or you've got a new program you want to launch because, guys, this is serious stuff. It is some of the best content you'll get there from someone who's actually done it, the most important thing. The question you should ask any 
guru or someone trying to sell you a program is what's the biggest thing you've done or what have, have you actually done the advice you're trying to give out? Johnny's lived it and breathed it. He's been successful in offline businesses, online businesses, and everything you heard today has been fantastic advice and is a testament to the quality of what he's putting out there. So take him up on that seven-day free trial if you haven't already. If you did it in the past, sounds like there's tons of great stuff to get back into it over. And uh, guys, we'll keep you updated. Johnny, thanks so much. We'll see you in the next episode. Thanks, Michael. If you enjoy this show and want to hear more of our work, be sure to subscribe to this podcast. For links and resources mentioned in this episode, including a free ebook on how to find more guitar students, visit us at www.topmusic.co slash guitar or check out the show notes. And lastly, thanks again for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.